Okay. Hang on, almost there. All right. Okay, I'm gonna run it through my page and I'm sharing it to our group till we get this worked out for the next time. And let me make sure it is showing up there. Yeah, it is. Yep. We okay. Excellent. Got it. Perfect. Hey. There it is. Okay. Should I push play? See what we look like. It's going. Good job. Going. All right. <laughs> Excellent. So sorry, everybody, that we're running a little behind. We had a technical issue, but I think we've got all that worked out the way we can work it out for right now and hopefully we'll get the kinks worked out for the next time. Um, I want to welcome everybody. I want to thank everybody for your interest. Uh, you know, we have over 3,000 members in the group, which is amazing. We've added over 1,200 people just in the last few days. So keep inviting your friends. Um, this is the Canine Conservancy Facebook group. And uh, just to give you a little background of how the group started, um, I think when we were all locked down during the pandemic, we all got creative of how to spend our time, not just milling around eating ourselves to death and watching TV. So Doug did um, last year, right before the Clumber National was unfortunately not held, Doug did a live uh, about his clumbers and, um, and you know evaluation and showed his dogs and everything. And I found that very inspiring and I know it was very popular with people. And so people started doing live of their kennel visits. And uh, I did one as well. And I started um, a group called Docs Ed 101 to bring education out. And we did panel discussions like this and interviews and offered all kinds of different things. So Doug and I got to talking and uh, I know he had previously worked with Bill and some others um, on a group. And we got to talking about how we could make it more for all breeds and uh, breeders and people, you know, all different kinds of people. So we have actually, this group have been brainstorming the last few weeks and months um, to bring all of this to you. So we're very excited to have you here. Um, before we get to our intros, I do wanna go over our mission statement. Um, it is posted in the group, uh, but this is what we came up with. As the leaders in the preservation breeders movement, we raise awareness for individual dog breeds and support the critical work of preserving unique traits. Today's enthusiasts have the option to select a dog that fits their lifestyle based on a crafted genetic breed trait that have been retrained over, retained over generations of purposeful breeding. We educate the public on the value of dogs with predictable physical and behavioral um, characteristics. So, um, that is our mission statement. We do have some goals um, while we're talking, uh, maybe not tonight, but in the future, um, you know, awareness of the challenges of raising purebred dogs, the higher level success of dog breedings, raising awareness of purebred dogs, broadening their experience in dogs, where can we recruit people and what we need to plant that seed. You know, breeders are the lifeblood, especially in our sport and just in general of offering quality health of the animals and breeders have to breed to be able to become selective. So that's kind of our intro for tonight. Um, we're gonna go into our introductions and I'll go first. My name is Lexa Richmond. I have Hialeah Standard Smooth Dachshunds. I have been breeding about 20 years and uh, you know, I'm, and owned by the Dachshunds. I don't own them, they own me. And uh, I am, um, an AKC judge of Dachshunds. And um, I'm also in my personal life, my real world job, I'm a school teacher. So I'm off for the summer, which is great. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Let's go over to Bill. Bill, you wanna give an intro about yourself? Oh gosh, um, well, I've been a dog enthusiast all my life, but I've loved animals in general. And I've dedicated myself to the preservation of purebred dogs and purposefully breeding. I, um, I judge dogs. I've judged all over the world. I've judged the world dog shows. I've judged at 
many of the what I consider the really great shows in the world and I enjoy all of them and they're all different and I hope to bring a, a different perspective to the uh, group um, in the sense that um, I, I want to be open to everyone and anyone who um, is interested in uh, expanding their resources and ideas about breeding dogs. I, I um, am also a dog breeder, of course. I have a family of um, uh, corgis, Pembroke Welsh corgis, and I, we breed them under the uh, prefix of Coventry, and uh, they've been quite successful. I, uh, <laughs> I, I just enjoy uh, dog people and discussing dogs more than anything. And I hope that uh, we can all learn from each other and we'll enjoy one another's company and that uh, we may not all agree on every subject, but that's how we learn from one another. And in this group, we don't um, expect us all to agree. And that's how we're gonna bring diverse and, um, opinions and, and learn from one another. Excellent. Thank you so much. Jenny, let's go over to you. Hi, I'm Jenny Chen. I share my home with Greater Swiss Mountain Dogs and Lao Chen or Lu Hen or Lo Shen, just depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, those are my two breeds of choice. I've been exhibiting dogs in a variety of sports, such as obedience, rally, herding, um, water rescue, weight bull, drafting, all sorts of sports, including confirmation. Um, I do breed my dogs and I am really excited about getting new people into the world of purebred dogs. Excellent, thank you so much. Antoinette, let's go over to you. All right, so I am Antoinette Volpes and um, I am a lifelong dog enthusiast, but just a relative newcomer to the world of confirmation. Um, I have, um, I've always been passionate about purebred dogs, especially rare breeds, which was the inspiration uh, behind me getting the current breed that I have now, which is a Sky Terrier. And so I have, um, you know, dabbled in confirmation a bit and have, have been having a lot of fun um, as an owner handler. And um, well, professionally, I used to work for the American Kennel Club and I do currently help out with Westminster Kennel Club. And, you know, I am a graphic designer, so I'm pretty well versed in canine advertising. So if anyone ever has questions about that kind of thing, I'm more than happy to walk people through that. But yeah, so I'm just really excited to be part of this team and to hopefully, you know, inspire newcomers to get involved in purebred dogs and to give our canine sports a try. You know, it might seem intimidating at first, but you know, if you have a really good mentor, a good group of people, a good dog, you know, anything can happen, so. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, let's go over to Doug. I'm Doug Johnson and I breed various spaniel breeds under the Clussex prefix, um, some sporting spaniels and English toy spaniels. But I'm a judge first and I'm a judge, an exhibitor, but I'm a really, concentrate on being a breeder first and foremost. It's the most important thing to me. Uh, if I had to give it all away, I would certainly pick being a breeder. It's the most rewarding, it's the most satisfying. You also have the most control of the outcome at that point. So I, I certainly love um, breeding dogs. I look forward to sharing stories of how we breed, how to breed better dogs, how to engage people in the sport of purebred dogs. Um, I, you know, We all have our sort of things that worry us the most. And one of the things that worries me is the dwindling number of breeders we have engaged in the sport today. So that's sort of something I was focusing on in trying to pull together this group. Bill and I have successfully given many programs about breeding and we want to encourage and inspire people to, to breed more dogs and breed dogs and show dogs and, and get a, a healthier family of dogs. So we're looking forward to where this takes us. Excellent, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, one thing before we move into our content for tonight, I do wanna remind everybody out there listening and in, that's in the group, um, we have a no tolerance policy for bullying. Um, we want to make sure that everybody in the group feels safe. So bullying of any kind isn't allowed and degrading comments about things like race, culture, sexual orientation, gender, or identity will not be tolerated. And we will also not tolerate the abuse of each other, uh, whether it is 
through just lively discussions or comments or chats or anything like that. So please keep that in mind. Um, we will have to remove you from the group if we find that that's a problem. Um, one of the other things I wanna mention before we move around to our uh, three piece for the evening is uh, what we are offering here is the community of purebred and purpose bred community. Um, you know, we're offering a community for everybody, a place of discussion, a place where you can ask questions. It's supposed to be an inviting, non-confrontational environment for everybody to talk and listen. Um, you're, you know, you're getting the uh, value added of experts and we will be bringing other people in in the future on our panels. So look forward to that and we will release that information um, as it gets closer to those times. Uh, you know, the value added part is the mentorship, the perspective and the goals. And hopefully we are increasing the interest um, in purebred dogs and in breeding and preserving our breeds. So if you have seen on the page, the logo, you have seen that uh, the three P's are promote, preserve and protect. So that's kind of kind of be some of our focus this evening. Um, and so let's talk about everybody what those three words mean. Let's do a word at a time. Let's talk about promote and what that means um, to each individual um, as far as purebred dogs and preserving dogs. Um, and I'll let anybody jump in first. Let's talk about promoting. Well, my perspective about promotion would have to come from promoting dog breeders first and promoting the breeding of purposefully bred dogs because, you know, our sport um, seems to, um, although that's what we all partake in and that's who we are um, most generally, but what, it seems like the whole sport has become an industry um, that has taken over um, the identity of dog breeders or, or who, we, who we really are. It should be reverse. The dog breeders should come first and then the sport should come second. And I, I'm really looking forward to helping people identify more about being a, a successful dog breeder than being just a successful exhibitor. Yeah, I love the word promote because it, you can go different places with it. And as Bill says, you know, the industry of dogs promoting dogs, you know, a confirmation people in our country think about promoting purebred dogs. And they think that means promoting that individual dog to the limelight or to become, you know, the top dog of its, of it, of its breed. But really, uh, I think parent clubs, the individual parent clubs, they're, they should take on the role of promoting their breed to the public, um, to buyers, to a market um, so that we have people to buy the dogs that we breed. So there's a promotion of your breed to the world, to the, um, you know, the, the uh, buying public. Promote also can mean to elevate, um, to promote and elevate a breed, to keep it um, in check. And I think that is a parent club's role is to protect and promote a breed. Yeah, that's excellent, Doug. You know, um, this past weekend, I gave a presentation at a national club and I mentioned, like we've always mentioned that wouldn't it be great if every parent club had a breeders committee and they were like, well, what would the breeders committee do? Well, we have a thousand ideas for you. And a lot of those ideas have to do with, why don't we start with mentorship? Why don't you start, why doesn't the breeders committee start an inter-mentoring -ment community where they bring along new people, young people? Um, it doesn't, you know, I, we always talk about young people. I don't think that that's necessarily the most important thing. I think it's about bringing in new people and new imaginative ideas and new perspectives. So we follow all the old perspectives and, you know, this is a burgeoning new new society and culture. And we need to look at those imaginative things that are useful and resourceful and will develop uh, better ideas about dog breeders and, and breeding dogs. And, and these are the best of times for dog breeders. We have so many tools available to us now in the way of DNA genetic markers. We have the most fabulous organization, the Canine Health Foundation, that's working for us every day and that we're also working for them to help them um, r raise um, valuable resources to um, develop more um, uh, uh, ways of 
uh, protecting and, and promoting our dogs in a healthy manner. And that's the other thing is that, um, you know, these a breeders committee could promote health within their club and, and what's really important and, and identify those things and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and uh, there's so many things that a, a breeders committee could do in a parent club. And Doug and I have talked about this many times. And uh, we, even when we went and spoke with the American Kettle Club, we discovered they didn't have a breeders committee. Uh, they formed one and they have one since and they're developing those things. And of course, last year they had designated the uh, last year as the year of the breeder. Well, uh, we all know what happened. And so it was some difficult times. So um, at any rate, um, promoting, uh, there's so many ways to promote your breed, but I love the idea of having a breeders committee within every parent club. Well, I think also there's, um, there's other ways for you to promote your breed too, you know, even if you are thinking about being a breeder and you're not there yet, if you're just an owner of a purebred dog, you know, just walking down the street, introducing your dog to new people, answering questions that people have about your dog. You know, what kind is that? You know, can I pet your dog? You know, tell me a little bit about this. Like just starting a conversation with people and um, just educating them in just little parts of the day just really overall is something that greatly contributes to the awareness and promoting of that breed that you love so much. So there's just a lot of small things that you can do before jumping into the breeder pool. Um, and even just at a dog show, if you're at a, dog, a canine event, there are spectators that come around, you know, just a lot of them are a little intimidated to come up to people and ask questions, but you know, just be approachable. And if you do have time, answer questions about your dog. And that's just another way that you can do your part. You're exactly yeah. right. I mean, yeah. you know, coming from, you know, starting with a rare breed, I mean, we have that in common. And just the exposure to those breeds is a form of promotion of those breeds. Because it is, and I think when we put on events, at least for me, I think about how do we make sure the minor breeds are represented? How do, how do they have a little bit of a venue to um, be showcased or to make people aware? That's the beautiful thing about dog showing. I mean, you can go to, you know, a Tumwa and you can see a Chesky Terrier and it may be the only Chesky you've ever seen in your entire life. And that inspires someone to go out and get one. I've never seen anything like it, you know? So you go, wow, it just sparks an interest. So that that is absolutely a form of promotion. Oh, yeah. So important. And there's so many different forms of promotion. There's promotion of your breed. Then there's the promotion of the idea that purebred dogs, because now we live in a world where you can order almost anything on Amazon. You can get things exactly to your spec. You can order a car with the exact type of leather that you want. And there's all these different dog breeds. We should be promoting the idea that you need to find a dog that fits your lifestyle. So there's promotion of purebreds in general, you know, someone who's looking for a dog. Maybe my dog breeds is not a good fit for them, but the idea that they should go out, that they should be prioritizing what fits in my household. And then along with that, I really do see these breed clubs, these parent clubs as stewards of the breeds. And they should be thinking about promotion, but not just new people because there's the recruitment piece and there's also the retention. How do you do both pieces? Because you absolutely need both. You can't keep saying, well, I'm gonna bring in new people, new people, but not retain people into this group and expand that knowledge base. So there's so many ways for us to promote. There, are, like Bill said, a thousand things for us to do. Yeah, it's so important, you know, and another part of promotion is the great work that the AKC PAC and the National Animal Interest Alliance does. That's a source of promotion because if we don't have, um, a representation legislatively, which is incredibly important, and we don't promote ourselves within those venues, well, we won't have a 
place at the table and the place at the table going into the 21st century is going to be so important that we move into it in a way that we're again imaginative and productive and that we present ourselves in ways that are valuable to the general public we can't just live in a vacuum in in the sport of purebred dogs because as the akc and other people have said we produce less than one percent of all the pets that go out there so uh, but we are the good guys and we are the people who are doing it best uh, through health and happiness and and uh, promotion of good intellect and, and, and purposefully bred dogs. So, but legislatively, it's very important to promote ourselves as well. And I, and I really suggest, and I always do, that if you don't have a grassroots organization at your local level, then you be that grassroots um, organization. You go out and meet your legislator and go out and tell our story because we have a lot of other people telling our story and they're not telling it well, and they're not telling it correctly. Um, they're telling it adversely as a matter of fact to our to who and what we actually are well, then, then, uh, go ahead Alexa sorry. oh I was just gonna say we do have a few comments and questions coming in off the chat so if you're out there don't feel afraid to put something in and we'll I promise I'm not ignoring you we'll get to it when we get to it um somebody asked um Doug how does your version of promotion conflict with the clubs that are saying, like when their breeds get popular, oh no, this will ruin our breed, things like that. Yeah, I saw that. And I think that, you know, we have seen um, a rise in popularity in a breed have some ill effects by the fact that they get very popular very quickly. Um, so there have to be safeguards put in place, um, but that, I don't think that negates the promotion of the breed. I think that means there's more responsibility put on the parent club, put on the individual breeder. And one of the things where I, I was, we were sort of getting to it with Bill is when you promote breeds and, your, and purebred dogs and promote breeders, you have to also promote what that breeder term means. So where we're saying is not only are you buying a quality dog that's been purposely bred over many generations, with a predictable outcome, because we've known every parent in the pedigree for a long time, you're also buying from an individual who's bought into that mantra and is gonna stand by that animal through the course of its life. So when it's eight and 10 years old and they're having maybe an orthopedic issue, they know to call you and report back to you and you can suggest, you know, well, if maybe it needs to go on a diet, maybe it needs this type of medication. So we're there for those dogs for the life of the dog. I um, mean, that, that certainly is one of the benefits from buying from a quote, responsible breeder. And, you know, someone who's bought into this uh, protect and preserve. Excellent. Uh, one of the other questions that's coming in is um, about mentoring. How would you suggest that a parent club determine who should be official mentors for a breed? Well, you know, that's um, not complicated at all. I mean, I know a lot of people try to make it complicated, but you know, the people with experience should be the mentors and they should step forward and they should be the people. Again, um, we will have people in every parent club, just like we will here this evening, that we won't all agree. We won't all agree with each other's um, opinions about certain things, but yet we still have a message and we can still bring that message forward and help people learn from it. So anyone who is um, a good teacher or even a decent teacher who has background and information would be a good source as a mentor um, in the breed. And uh, and I understand there are many people in many breeds who feel that sometimes this is very politicized. And so in that, there's no room for that. There's only room for education and teaching, not for politicization of, of making their family of dogs more important than someone else's or making themselves more uh, visible or more important than the other. The whole thing is to be altruistic and to be there for the breed and to move the breed forward and teach in that manner. Well, I think too that sometimes the best breeders in a particular breed don't always have a number one dog or campaign or things like that. You know, they have longevity in the breed where they're able to educate, but that doesn't mean that their value is less because they haven't had a number one dog or, you know, whatever the priority is. So I just keep that in mind. 
I agree 100%. Um, you know, many of the best breeders are quiet people who go about their business and produce many champions, but may not have the resources or the contacts to promote a dog to be a group winner at the garden or, or the top winning dog of all breeds. But many times those dogs right in their uh, fam within their family of dogs are probably and could very well be the best dogs that um, any of us have ever seen. So I agree with that. That's a very good point. Excellent. And we all bring something to the table. We all contribute in some way or the other. Absolutely. Um, this says Doug alluded to it somewhat saying reputable breeders stand behind their puppies for the life of the dog. What are ways we can combat for profit breeders who might be doing our breed harm? Well, I think um, that's a good point, but um, I also want to say there are not-for-profit breeders who are bringing harm to our breeds, and so I think we must look at it that way. We can't look at that for-profit is a bad thing because we have many people um, it, that are bringing good things about and towards our breeds that um, also uh, sell, do sell their dogs and breed larger numbers of dogs than you will. That's why um, we don't always use the word responsible. We, we you know, um, the, we need people who are, um, no. go ahead, Doug, what were you going to say? Accountable. That are accountable, exactly. We like the word accountable because you have to be accountable to your local jurisdiction. You have to be accountable to your parent club. You have to be accountable to the American Kennel Club. And if you're accountable to those things, then that's good enough. And and if you're, it, it, but first of all, as we've pointed out, you have to be accountable to your very own family of dogs, first of and foremost. But in that, I just want to say that we, we do like to focus on high volume breeders being the demon. And I think we're going to um, have, we're going to be speaking about some of that in the future, but um, there are many, um, as we know, there are many people that we rub elbows with that we wouldn't necessarily um, let house our dogs or breed them either. So um, it isn't um, something that's just in the high volume breeder world. It's, it's also um, within our own sport. Yeah, I think they become uh, a scapegoat, you know, this breeding for profit. Well, it's such an ex expensive um, avenue to walk down to start with breeding dogs. And it's costly financially, emotionally. Um, it's, it's a very challenging thing to do. And, you know, I think we've all talked about this and you know, the, the definition of high volume breeder becomes the person who bred one more litter than you. And, you, you know, then we start to be judgmental because we tend to be a little exclusive. Um, and we're trying to, part of the reason we're doing this is to break some of that down and maybe reform an opinion about what it means to be a high volume breeder. What does it mean to be, you know, engaged in the sport of purebred dogs? We need to be more inclusive across the board. And remember that there was a time when we had large kennels of dogs and hundreds of, of dogs being bred. And those were where you went to breed your dogs because they were breeding the dogs you needed to use. So those days are sort of over and the world has changed a little bit because of that. But I mean, uh, the stats are what they are. And, and as Bill points out, we have a very small percentage of our AKC population being produced for pets, where, where are these other people going? Well, they're going to, you know, quote, high volume breeders. Right. And I think, I think our focus, I think our focus will become that we're going to discuss what an accountable breeder is and that we're going to try to um, not use um, the words that we've used in the past, but I identify and, and shape what um, an accountable breeder is and whether they breed um, one more litter a year than you do or, or five more litters a year than you do. But um, because there is, um, there's accountability uh, and accountabilities to your breed and how do you improve your breed if you don't breed them. The only way you're going to change health statistics or you're going to change type or, or you're going to move soundness forward is by breeding your family of dogs forward. You're not going to statically say, I'm going to breed my dogs or my family of dogs every three years 
it's it's not going to, you're not going to be contributing as much. And I'm not saying that a high volume breeder who does it uh, willy nilly, who doesn't put in the time, who doesn't put in the education, doesn't put in the research, is they're not they're not they're not moving it forward. But neither are people who breed only one or two litters a year and do the same thing. So an accountable breeder would be an educated breeder who brings resources to the table and and moves the breed forward in health, happiness, character, soundness and type. So um, I think that's what we need to focus on is, is who's accountable and bring, th bring the light and shine the light on them and uh, let the others fall by the wayside. I like that. Let's go on to our second word um, in our logo is, um, and we've hit on some of this, but I think we can expand. Uh, moving on to preserve. Let's go into that and let's talk about preserving, you know, our individual breeds and your thoughts on that. I'll leave it out to, I'll put it on the table for anybody. Well, I think, you know, preserving a breed is uh, maintaining a, a breed's integrity. Uh, we preserve them. You know, I, we use the word preserve when we think about how do you preserve something from going extinct and it comes for me, coming from very rare breeds, you know, I worry that at, at some point there won't be any. You know, who's going to breed them when you're gone? So you retain and breed to preserve the breed existence. And from that, you preserve quality. You also preserve genetic traits. And that's where your family of dog comes in. So for me, I've always felt like preserve had three very distinct meetings. Um, and I, and I, and they, it, they kind of overlap a bit, but they all go towards the greater good, which is to make sure that the breed stays unique, stays um, easily identifiable as a unique breed, and is thriving. Right, and the character is retained, because the character is very specific to the breed too, isn't it, Doug? Yeah. And the and then the last thing would be that we um, bring it forward in a healthier, happier state. As I mentioned before, we have some of the most incredible tools now to make our dogs healthier. And it is a, another thing we have to we have to focus on, which is difficult for breeders here in the 21st century, is that now do we not only have to focus on all those things that Doug just mentioned and that we're mentioning, but we also have to bring them forward in a better state of health. And we now have have tools to do that uh, more tools than ever Thanks. exciting times yeah do you think preserving the breeds is um different for a very popular breed i have a very popular breed versus a non-popular breed that the public is not necessarily aware what do you think about that about preserving and the importance of that when it comes to rare breeds, I mean, I have two that almost went extinct at some point in time, and one of them, the numbers dropped dramatically very recently, um, at least in the United States. You know, preserving a rare breed, we really changed the conversations that we're having with owners. When I saw the numbers had dropped so drastically, the conversations I was having with people is, you are now the ambassador. If you get one of these dogs, it is your job, your duty, because you may love this dog, but if you don't do this, take on this work, you may never get another. And that was really scary because before then I just thought, well, you know what, I'll just get one whenever I want. But that no longer was an option. Those options were not even there anymore because nobody was out there really saying, hey, we need to preserve this. Nobody was really looking at the numbers until I put them on Facebook and people were like, uh, we knew the numbers were dropping the show ring, didn't realize the registration numbers were plummeting so low. So um, I have friends who have breeds that are not quite in that position and they don't have those conversations. Their conversations are a little bit different. Um, they're a lot about, you know, finding the right people, making sure that they can, um, when they promote their own breedings that they're promoting themselves in a way that is different from, you know, um, other types of breeders that you might find. Antoinette, do you want to give your experience with having a, a rare breed? Well, I mean, I, I grew up with very common with a very common breed with golden retrievers and they were just my pets. And I think, you know, after being around the world of confirmation, seeing all different types of dogs, um, you know, there's just something about the rare breeds that really wanted, you know, the, it was just more appealing, just realizing that getting involved in one of these breeds or well, sky terriers, like I could make a bigger difference. 
And so even if I show up at events and I'm the only entry there, just being there and representing that breed in the group is exposure that we need. And, you know, if we are able to be on, you know, television or something, you know, there have been so many people who have been like, oh, I saw this dog on TV. Oh, I've seen this dog, you know, on the show. Like, this is the type of exposure that rare breeds need. And you never know when just like one little glimpse, a couple seconds on a screen will inspire someone to what help, excellent point. you know, preserve. Excellent so, point. Yeah. So even if you're the only one, don't get discouraged. Just go there and, and just know that, you know, you're making a difference just showing up. See, I think that's a very good point. And that's why also the all breed clubs need to start promoting, going back to promoting dog shows to the general public, because that's how we're going to get more exposure for those breeds that, like you said, where there's only one there. You know, when I judge and there's someone there with one dog of their breed, I thank them for coming and presenting their dog and, and bringing awareness to them. And, and uh, I think it's great enlightenment. And But, but we need to um, be able to have a venue where we have an audience that we invite the general public to dog shows once again, instead of excluding them, which we have, and, and let them see these other breeds and be interested in these other breeds. You know, it's, 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 it's just like some people within a very popular breed, as you notice, they can promote their family of dogs better than someone else. Why? Because of exposure. So it's, it's all about exposure. And like you said, I love that you mentioned about, you know, having that elevator speech or that market speech and telling them about and say, and when they say, well, what kind of dog do you have? And you can explain it to them and, and protect and promote that breed by telling them about it and being excited and passionate about it, which I know you are. And, you know, it's something ironic happened just two days ago when I was at the dog show was um, we were at the hotel and this woman said to me, I mean, it, it, this is like, this is because I, I was able to promote my breed and to explain to her about the history of the breed. She asked me, what two breeds do you cross to get a Corgi? So that tells you, but that really tells you about the general public's mentality, you know, how, how they're so unaware and how we have the opportunity to teach them and to give them awareness about um, rare breeds and, and, and about popular breeds also. Yeah. yeah I, think I was... Um... Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. No. <laughs> no, I was just going to, I've gotten, you know, kind of funny mix suggestions too. walking my dog down the street. Someone was literally driving their car and pulled over and was like, what is that? And they're like, is that, is that a wolfhound corgi? And I was like, first of all, my mind was like completely blown just thinking about how that would work. But on the other hand, I was kind of impressed that they knew what a wolfhound was. And that they figured in, you know, that corgis have short legs. So that was the viable answer. So, I mean, you know, it's just another learning opportunity, but sometimes like the guesses are pretty entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wanted to go back to where you were going, Lexa, which I think is really a, a interesting point, you know, to talk about um, when we talk about preservation breeders and to speak to that term and breed uh, dachshunds or golden retrievers or Labradors, you know, you think, well, those breeds, you, you really can't be a preservation breeder of those breeds. And then you realize, well, wait a minute, of course you can, because you're still trying to retain that true essence of that breed. And because those breeds go through so many fads and their genetic pool is so wide and so broad and so vast, it's almost more challenging to preserve those unique breed specific traits and have them reproduce over and over and over again. So while it's not always a um, extinction issue, it's, it can be a, a, a diminished genetic trait that you're working on preserving and retaining. Um, as if you look at breeds like golden retrievers and you see the styles uh, upon style upon style, and you were to run some uh, pedigrees and see how genetically diverse and wide open they are, you know, without a true family of, of, of animals there, it becomes a bit scarce in retaining predictable outcomes to those pairings. So 
that's where I think you go with sort of the, the more common popular breed when they talk about preserving. They're retaining the, or they're attempting to retain that original intent. Well, and I will say, as a, having a more popular breed, uh, it, it can be difficult to find a, a dog that is value added to your breeding program. And it, even though it, it may be populous, it sometimes is still a very small pool, you know, sure. to keep going. And, and it can be quite difficult. And as, as we get more into talking about how to breed a family of dogs in the future programs, we're, we're going to be dis discussing a lot of that because it's interesting because um, even within a breed of my own, which we now are in the top 10 registrations of the AKC, that we have families of dogs that are all becoming more related than not related, and that's across the world. And so it's getting harder and harder to find dogs that are diverse in pedigree. And so therefore diverse in health issues and diverse in character and, that we can go to and, and, and outcross to. So even within, like you just mentioned, you guys, is that even in large breeds with large populations, as you mentioned, it, some of those gene pools are getting all alike and we need to uh, quit um, thinking about uh, breeding to the, the popular sire or breeding uh, su successfully like our neighbor does or our friend does. Uh, we need to start being more independent and bringing to the table those uh, diverse aspects that we want to bring and that we think are beautiful in our breed. And I think that's really, really important. And I think independent breeders used to do a lot more of that than the populace today, as you were mentioning. There's a lot of people who just breed alike today and because, uh, well, they need more direction and more education and that sort of thing. And we, we'll, we'll talk more about that, I think, as we get into uh, developing families of dogs. And that's the stuff I'm really looking forward to. And I know we're just getting introductions in tonight and all of that, but um, they're really the, that, that, that's going to be great fun. I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. I appreciate everybody's comments on that. Let's go to our last P of our logo and our philosophy, which is protect. So what does that word mean to you in the realm of being a, what we're trying to do as a preservation breeder? What does, um, what do you think about that? And I'll let that open to the floor, protect. Well, we already discussed promotion and promotions oftentimes related to the protection. And I already mentioned, I guess I jumped the, the gun in talking about the AKC PAC or the, or the National Alma Interest Alliance or organizations like that, or even your parent club who does uh, uh, protect their own breed and, and they protect it in health and, and all of those things because uh, we're raising the bar for um, genetic testing and, and, and all of things like that. But stepping back again about legislators, uh, you know, your legislator is totally unaware, just like the woman who asked me this weekend, what two breeds do you cross to get that, to get that mm -hmm. corgi? And, uh, you know, she doesn't know that um, if you genetically tested it, that it, it's purebred now. It's, it's, it's now um, a purebred dog after uh, the four generations that it's been purely bred, but they're unaware of those things. And so anyway, so, but, but again, um, we need to pr um, uh, protect it by making sure that we're able to breed a litter of dogs, that we're able to own that dog of, of choice, that we're able to, um, um, you know, ha have, a, have a venue that we can exhibit them. And uh, there are many, I, I, I can go that we're going to have, I'm sure, a program on this, too, about the protection of them, because, as you know, there are states out there who don't even want you to necessarily have events. Uh, they don't want you. Uh, breeding is um, a negative aspect in their state. And and there's a lot of laws that are being trying to be developed and promoted um, uh, in, in that course. And simply, I mean, just like AB 1634, I'll step back to that one in the state of California, you know, several years ago that we all fought, fought successfully, which was the sterilization of every cat and dog in the state of California. And that's a hard job to do. And if it wasn't for, again, mostly um, uh, purebred dog breeders, hunting dog pe people, people um, who raise purebred dogs because they know that they're consistent and that they're able to, um, uh, I'm sorry, to develop those, um, um, oops, I'm sorry, gang, sorry about that. Maybe, um, is that we, um, 
we, we, we were able to successfully fight AB 1634 and stop that. So we, in essence, in the state of California, protected um, at that time, what was 17% of AKC's registrations and participation in the sport of dogs, 17%, that's almost 20% in that day and time. So protecting comes in many different forms. So we can talk about it as simply as our own family of dogs or in the greater aspect of uh, protecting the sport, which also protects breeders and they're able to bring forward and breed dogs purposefully. So I, always enjoy listening to Bill on the protect word uh, because he has all of the legalities and all of the, you know, he's, uh, that's, uh, he's very involved in, and the whole sport owes him a little bit there for sure because we're not up on that and probably not up on it as much as we, we should be. But for me, protect is really kind of smaller and, and more, um, uh, I, I think of protect as the parent club must protect a breed and you protect the integrity of the breed. You protect the written standard and the original intent. And I, I am a big one. I, I think about the definition of your breed and that the parent club should always be working to make sure that that breed is kept protected and not uh, subject to fad. And, and we have seen recently some animal rights groups affect our breeds um, and parent clubs not protect them um, to a level that they should have, where they changed things and made things, um, took some breed specific traits away. Um, so I, I see protecting meaning that we have to protect our breed's integrity. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and that does come, you know, down to like you're talking about changing breed specific things in some of those other countries about when it came to uh, brachiocephalic breeds and achondroplasty breeds and those oh, breeds God. that they're considered unhealthy. Well, that's far from the truth, you know, um, and and yeah, we, we could go a great deal. into all, that. all end up going to Canada. I mean, all of these things lead to what you're discussing. Yeah, but I'm just thinking I just like I, to, I keep it a little smaller. Right, because and, and that's going to uh, appeal to this group more because uh, we're going to be able to um, do that um, with them. So I agree. Yeah, it's a good, it's an excellent point. I also think, you know, on the smaller scale of protecting, you know, there's people who can maybe go too far with the protecting, right? So, you know, you're protecting your breeding program, you're protecting your lines, you're protecting years and years of hard work and and dedication to this breed that you don't let anyone else in. So I think, you know, that's something we are gonna be talking about and that we should talk about just how, you know, how there will be some breeders who will keep all the nice puppies for themselves. Or I know some breeders who keep all the puppies for themselves. So it's just, we kind of gotta, you know, ease the leash a little bit, open the conversation and just encourage people to like, to trust each other a little bit more, I think, is something. One hundred percent, I agree. We can work. You know, we we become very exclusive. That's uh, it. And, and you You're think right. you you think that that has done a world of good for you? It's really filtering your ego there. Um, mm -hmm. The reality is that opening your kennel for other people to use your dogs is beneficial. We know this. Um, so I love that you brought that up because we will certainly touch on that later, but that is absolutely, absolutely right. She brought two, two, two fabulous points up, you know, to the, this evening, and this is one of them about we're not promoting, yeah, we're not promoting our dogs by by holding them so closely to us that we're not allowing them to expand the gene pool. And there are so many people that um, are doing that, and I love that you brought this up because, you know, within um, my two breeds and my breed, my specific breed right now, there are people they hold such tight strings on those dogs, and you can't breed to their dogs. You can't. You can't, uh, you know, if you do breed to their dogs, there's generations that you can't do anything with. But you know what? And, and, and like Doug said, you know, that's a very egotistical sort of approach and that 
and that at the end of the day, we should be um, expanding the breeds gene pool through other accountable um, breeders. And I'll be quiet, Judge. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Um, I was going to say that actually circles back to like the mentoring and actually giving people dogs. I mean, yes, there's a fine line. And I think a lot of people, um, at least people who I've talked to, when they think about mentoring, they think, okay, well, you know, what are you going to dictate? What are you going to make me do? And to me, my mentors have never been that way. They've been saying, what are your goals? Let me help you get there. What can I help you do, be it sports, be it breeding or confirmation? And that's another way for us to think about it, because let's get real. 50 years, we may not be here. We have to think about what the future is going to be and who's going to be in that seat. I can't say, hey, I don't want this person here, because guess what? That person's going to go to somebody else, maybe not get mentoring, or maybe just not even join the purebred dog world. We have to say, hey, these people are interested. How do we help them get to where they are going? Even if they don't do things exactly the way that we want them, how do we show them, hey, what's a better way? What are ways to make things easier? How do you still achieve goals? How do you still preserve, protect, and promote a breed, even though we do things differently? And that's something I really want to think about even in my day job. I tell people, I'm not building products. I build roads for the future to drive on. If you can build people, they can go anywhere. So that's excellent, Jenny, and I agree with you 100%. Because if we all step back, and particularly the people this evening from within the sport who think about purebred dogs, if we step back for just a moment and we look that we exist in a vacuum, we really do. And we're less than 1% of the population producing purebred dogs. So what impact are we going to do? And what are we going to do to protect, preserve those breeds that are ours that are being bred out there that are being bred by the other 99% of people bringing them into the world? If we make ourselves exclusionary, which we have for decades and we continue doing, and, and, and we're all guilty, even every one of us on this panel have been guilty in some way. And in and, and, and that we exclude educating those people and rather than bringing them into the fold and educating them and showing them the right way to do it, we're excluding them. We don't even, we don't even talk with them. We don't even rub shoulders with them. They're pariahs basically. And so until we make them and they are like us and there are many people out there breeding dogs that are within that 99% group that are accountable. They are accountable and we can we we can show you those 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 people and those numbers the american kill club can show you those people and those numbers but uh, until we recognize that there are other people worthy and that they are accountable and that they certainly are doing a good job but they don't have all the information we do maybe we can share it with them you know i have to tell you so i um i i moved here and i live here in missouri part part of the time I live in California. They're two very diverse states in their approach to dog breeding. But in the state of Missouri, they have a very um, proactive breeding community and they are a lot of high volume breeders, but they're so interested in doing it better. They're doing health testing. They're health there are health uh, testing clinics here. There, there are some people doing more health testing in the high volume world than there are people in the dog sport. And, and, and we can make that analogy to so many things. And now granted, there are many people uh, within our sport that are doing it the absolute best. They're the good guys, they're educated, they're using all the tools in the toolbox to make healthier, happier dogs. But we're not sharing that information with anybody. And particularly because we are still only 1% of the population producing purebred dogs. So with the other 99%, we need to, once again, bring under the tent and help them and educate them and protect and preserve our breed. Because sure, we can, we can protect and preserve that 1%, can't we? And we are. But what are we going to do for the greater part of, the, of, of, of the, the, your breed and, and the breed in the world? And Jenny can talk to that too, and uh, Doug can as well, because there are other places in the world that their breed is bred and protected much better than we're even doing possibly, or that you're doing it better than they're doing it. So there's many things to talk about in, in those issues, and we will as we go on. But um, I think if we step back and look, we exist in a vacuum. We're only 1%. So if we're really here to protect and preserve, we have to educate the other 99% of breeders in some way. And there are, and they are out there and they do want to be educated. I see them. That's what I was bringing about was being here in Missouri. These people are thirsty for information and they're learning to health, health test. And they're learning what test, what testing is valuable and important uh, to their breeds. So uh, and, and they want to make them more attractive and, and they, they want to, they, they, it's, 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 it's an interesting perspective, I think, that we think we're the only 1% that can do this right. 
But I think there's a huge difference between educating people and offering them all that information so they can get what they need to put in their personal toolbox and micromanaging people. Excellent point. Yeah, and like you, Bill, I talked to a lot of people this week and I have the same conversation with a couple of people and I'm very open about it. I have a five-year plan when you get into breeds with me. The first couple of years, I mentor you, I help you, I teach you how to evaluate dogs, learn the ins and outs. But in five years, you should be independent of me. You should be able to go to a show ring, evaluate a dog, make your own breeding selections. We're still going to be friends. We're still going to be buddies. You can call me in the middle of the night, but you don't necessarily need me there anymore. And I know that's pretty aggressive. Five years, I'm like, here's a ton of information. Just soak that in your head, put it in there, have a couple of litters. But I, I tell everybody that the goal is for them to run independent of me so that if I'm no longer here, they can run without me. Excellent. Well, I think people have to want to learn. It's not, this is not a codependent type of relation, long-term relationship of what we're doing, of bringing people in. And, you know, you have to want to go be, you know, find the information or want to learn with people. Because, and I know some people, a few people have said in the thread that they've been, you know, intimidated by coming and talking to, you know, it's not always easy to let your guard down if you're newer to come talk to a, a Doug Johnson or a Bill Shelton at a show. And so, you know, you have to kind of push that aside if you really, really want to do this. It does take some determination and grit, I feel like, to be very successful in what we're doing. I think that's very true. I mean, the reality is that, you know, we're conditioned to be somewhat proprietary. Um, and that is one of the things that we're working on changing, losing that exclusivity and adopting a more inclusive um, mantra. Because we know now the mistakes of being so exclusive in the sport because we need and want people to participate with us, get involved. And that is what moves the whole sport forward. So that's what we're looking for. And so right now in the last several years, you've seen a bunch of us get together and discuss, you know, how do we, how do you form satellite kennels? How do you keep people engaged, who's replacing you in the sport, all of those topics that we, uh, we will talk about and have talked about because we need individuals. You can't afford to lose anybody. Excellent, yes, indeed. Love it. All right, does any, we're coming up to our hour mark and I just wanna to say to the people who are making comments or asking questions, if I haven't addressed it, it's because we do have those discussions planned in the future. So please don't think I'm ignoring you. I promise we are going to be discussing those things in more depth and, um, and, and we'll push that information out to the group. Uh, does anybody want to add any last comments about our promote, preserve, protect that you uh, we may not have touched on tonight? Well, I would just like to say that I, I know that as we progress and we have these programs, this is a very just kind of topical, get to know, talk, discuss about the, the highlights and things. But I think it's going to be far more interesting when we start having one topic and we delve into those topics and whether they, it, it's how to breed a better family of dogs or how to legislatively stop anti-dog uh, breeding in your, in your community, or if it's about promoting a breed, um, a, a rare breed, all those things, I think that I think that's what's going to be really great is in the future when these programs come about and that we're able to really get into some really in-depth information for not only topically for the new perspective breeder, but for those breeders of uh, those of us who are going to learn from each other. I'm looking forward to learning from the people out there also uh, mm -hmm. things that I never um, thought about. And can I say um, on this on this committee? we have a new person who's new to dogs. And I have to say, she brought up two incredible points tonight that I think are incredibly important. So whenever you meet, whenever you set out to teach someone, you usually learn more than you set out to teach and, and or you're reminded about those things. And so I think it's fabulous that she brought up those two things. And, we, and those are complete topics. But at any rate, I'm looking forward to getting into those and really getting to the knit, knit and gritty about certain uh, aspects of breeding, breeding, showing and preserving dogs. It's gonna be great fun. Excellent. Antoinelle, do you have any last words? I mean, I'm just really excited to, you know, come into this group 
um, you know, as a breeding novice and to hopefully learn, you know, different things and, and values. And, and so when I start my own breeding program in the near future, you know, I'll have the tools already <laughs> ready to go to help me succeed. So, you know, this is, it's a, it's a new learning experience for me. And I just want other people in the group to know that like, you know, it's okay to be new and coming into this. And, and that's why we're here to, to just continue to learn and ask questions. So I feel like if you don't do that, then you're starting off on the wrong foot. So I think we're in the right place right now. Excellent. Thank you. Jenny, any last words? I got lots more words in the future. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Agreed. But I'm very okay. excited about this. This is um, really fabulous. I'm, I'm glad that we're all here. Glad that everybody's on here watching, listening, contributing, and excited to learn from other people as well. Excellent. Doug? Well, I'm grateful that we're um, doing this. I It's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. And I'm thrilled that it's uh, going well so far. I will say that this is just, you know, part of that lifelong learning. And we spend a lifetime of learning when you breed dogs. And you're, you never ever shut down to learning and you have to stay open to it. And just as, you know, Antoinette is here, she's teaching us um, and that's wonderful. So uh, good for everybody. I would like to say to everybody that's watching, if you have a topic that you're interested in to um, be sure to post that. Um, we have a list of things that we're going to get to. Um, and so we're always open for something unique or different that you want to hear about. We want to speak to what you want to know. So if there's something specific you've got, please feel free to contact one of us or um, post it on the um, Facebook group page and we'll certainly try to get to that. Excellent. And just before we kind of wrap up, I do want to remind everybody that it's just like Bill said before, we may as a panel not always agree. Um, we may just, you know, agree to disagree. We may have different views and maybe what you have uh, personally or experienced. So I would just remind you, um, you know, take what you need for your toolbox to be successful and, uh, you know, kind of pick and choose your information. And like I said, you know, they've mentioned that we're just all learning together and it's been very exciting and that uh, we will be bringing you all kinds of content in the future. Um, for now, uh, my panel, if you will stay on so we can wrap up privately, I'm gonna go ahead and log off. Thank you everybody for joining us and look on the page um, for future topics. Thank you. Thank you.